take everything out of my paycheck that you can for uh, savings deposit, take out everything you can for the additional limits. And uh, I think I, I told you guys that I think in December of that year, right, I deployed over a, over a holiday period. So between two calendar years, I had a, a paycheck that was one hundred and fifty eight dollars. And that <laughs> that made me feel so, it was I was so happy. Right. That would terrify most people. But I was like, yes, it's like I am sending all my money to all the places I want it to be. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast. Hey guys and gals, Spencer here from MilitaryMoneyManual.com. This podcast is all about achieving financial independence while you serve in the U.S. military. Every episode, we deep dive into military financial topics to help you achieve FI as soon as possible. I'm here with my co-host, Jamie, and a special guest today, Luke. Before we get started, we just want to thank you all for the reviews and the questions that keep coming in. We're up to 55 five-star reviews on Spotify, 22 reviews on Apple, 4.8 stars. I guess somebody wasn't too happy with one of our episodes, and over 20,000 podcast downloads, which is pretty good for uh, two Air Force officers with no formal media training. I'm pretty happy with that. If you're enjoying the podcast and learning something, then please leave us a five-star review on your podcast app. Hit the subscribe or the plus button so so you'll see new episodes each week. And as always, if you have any questions, you can send us on Instagram at Military Money Manual or email info, I-N-F-O at MilitaryMoneyManual.com. Jamie, who's our guest today? Hey, thanks, Spencer. Uh, We're excited today to have our guest, uh, Luke. Luke is an active duty Air Force officer, fellow personal finance enthusiast and Uh, also pursuing financial independence and an expert in military benefits such as space available or space aid travel. Today, Luke is going to walk us through a real world journey towards financial independence and how to take advantage of the incredible benefits like space A travel opportunities to travel the world and how he saved over $41,000 in travel costs by using space A flights. Luke, welcome to the show. Can you start telling us, uh, start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your career and your background? Cool. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, guys, thanks for having me. Uh, I want to thank you for all the work you've done, the content you've been putting out. Um, I am an avid listener. I've listened to every show thus far. I've told several uh, several of my colleagues about the show, and I've told them if I ever had a podcast, this would be it. Um, you guys are hitting on some really uh, highly relevant content for military personnel that maybe haven't thought about um, the ability to actually retire when you hit the, the retirement time or just financial impenance uh, in general uh, when they get out to have the ability to actually um, choose what you do with your time. And, uh, it's a very powerful topic. So uh, I definitely appreciate you guys doing that. So I consider myself a C-17 pilot by trade. However, I've had a pretty, uh, diverse uh, career. Uh, started off as a, uh, officer training school graduate. So I didn't do ROTC or, or didn't go to the academy, anything like that. Um, served my initial tour, uh, as a special operations navigator. Uh, and while I was there, I was fortunate enough to be able to apply to cross train, uh, to become a pilot. Um, and after spending several years doing some really incredible work in some of the uh, more less desirable places, if I can say more or less, <laughs> um, uh, I kind of opted to take myself and my family uh, somewhere great. So we ended up out in Hawaii, where is where I crossed paths with you fine gentlemen. Yeah, that was awesome uh, working with you out in Hawaii and, and Jamie as well. So you're on the path to financial independence like like Jamie and uh, and me are. How did you get started on that goal? How did you hear about it? And what has been the hardest part for you? Um, man, that goes way back. Um, so I remember as a young teenager, um, riding with my mother and, uh, she had just kind of been passing was telling me a story that was, Hey, you know, if you have a million dollars, you can live off the interest. You'll make like four, you know, four to $5,000 a month. And I think given that time frame, that was probably about the time that the Trinity study was all being released. Um, obviously, you know, as a, as a teenager that knows it all, I, uh, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't stick with, you know, exactly what she, you know, didn't stick with me uh, immediately, but I always sort of knew that, um, save money when you can take advantage of, of opportunities that employers provide. So, um, 401ks, uh, now IRAs, like any, any time that the government or your employer is going to limit you in saving money, it's probably a good thing, right? So you need to do that. Um, uh, I had a good balance though. So my mother was really big into, you know, she wanted me to travel and see the world. And my, my father was really big into, you know, you need to save, you need to, um, it, some people would say thrifty or cheap. Um, and my wife would certainly say cheap, <laughs> uh, but there's a point to, to savings, right? It gets you out there. It gets you to where eventually you're going to have the, uh, the ability to control your, your time through that. So 
Um, needless to say, not to go too far back into time, but uh, I worked for some employers in high school and in college um, that offered 401k plans. And I, I obviously didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I was like, this sounds like a great deal. You give me a match. And so that's sort of where it all began. Um, I, uh, I've always been really, uh, really thrifty with, my, with things in my life and then getting in the military, learning about TSP, uh, and the advantages that we have a lot with combat zone tax exemption. Um, I really, uh, I really saw the ability to like take advantage of, of, you know, building this, this nest egg. And so, uh, hopefully kind of go back to, to what, what mom had told me years before, you know, you can live off the money, you know, the, I think, uh, Mr. Money Mustache calls it the little green employees that you have that are that are constantly out there working for you so you don't have to work quite as hard. Um, to take it into what probably is the most difficult aspect of five for me personally um, was was explaining it to the wife, right? Uh, trying to get your spouse on board with what you're doing as they see uh, this deprivation type environment, um, even though you know, and, and we'll get into that later of, of all the travel that we've done and all these things. It's like, wait, you're still trying to save all this money. Like, what's the point? Right. Um, and, uh, it took me, took me the better part of a decade, but I think I've worn her down to the point that now she, she's definitely on board. Um, she definitely understands and she sees the value, um, that comes from financial independence. So, uh, I think that's, I think a lot of people struggle with that. I think a lot of people have a hard time, um, being able to explain that to a spouse, really articulate the, uh, the value of a financially independent life. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think she's one of our top listeners, too, because I understand that you force her to listen to all the episodes <laughs> with you. So <laughs> thank you to Mrs. Luke <laughs> for her support on the show. But um, so when you tell others about FI or your financial independence goals, what are maybe the top one or two pieces of advice that, that you tell people and try to convince them that FI is a, is a, a worthy goal? Um. For me, and, and I've, I've been fortunate to have people who've reached out. Um, and as you guys know, I mean, this this ability to have a podcast and put this out there for listeners who are interested and want to have this information is is much different than uh, perhaps introducing this, right? We sound almost like a cult when we're like, <laughs> hey, uh, hey, you should put a lot of money into this and then someday you won't have to work. It almost seems like a, a MLM scheme, right? So to to really be able to structure it um, in a way that people are like comfortable with, with receiving it is, is really nice. But the big things I push out are simplicity. And, and for me personally, simplicity has always been a huge aspect of my financial independence life. It's um, don't, you know, don't get too complicated and don't get too in the weeds with um, trying to buy stocks, sell high, buy lo- like all that's It's not necessary. And, and for longevity in your financial life, it's not really appropriate. Like don't um, don't really try to like push yourself too far. Um, talk about a lot of this is the financial or sorry, the, this psychological aspect of money. And I think Spencer, uh, you actually a couple of years ago, um, in the height of COVID had, uh, had reached out to me and, and you suggested that I read Morgan Housel's book, uh, the psychology yeah, of money. And one. it really, that really wrapped up a lot. It was, a I, I call it confirmation bias in, in my <laughs> readings. Right. So I, I read it and I was like, you know what, this is what I'm doing. And it helps that understanding that money's a game, right? It's not, um, it's not a hard and fast thing. And as long as you're consistently making progress towards your goal, um, I think one aspect too of, the, of knowing the psychology is that you don't, even though certain things are possible, right? You can, you can feed your family uh, noodles every night and it, never go out and see an adventure life and have an incredible savings rate, but you're going to lose you're going to lose that ability to maintain that for, for the long haul. And that's what financial dependence is really all about. It's about, it's about the long term. It's about uh, once you actually have reached financial independence and being able to sustain that life um, that you sort of designed for yourself. Um, another great book that I'd read right after Morgan Housel's book was uh, Atomic Habits. I know this was an incredibly popular book. Um, James Clear had a really good quote in there that really stuck with me. And it's, it's also kind of confirmation bias again, but it says fall in love with fall in love with the process, right? Not with the results. And so you guys kind of know I'm, I'm a big fitness buff. I love to work out. And for me, it's never been, let's get ready for beach season, right? Let's get ready for this next event. It's never the result at the end of it. For me, it's the, it's the daily, I feel better every day when I work out, right? And every month that you put money in towards financial independence is the same way. You're getting that 1% better every single month. Um, physically, mentally, psychologically, psychologically, and emotionally, like you always, if you continue to just make little bits of progress, um, it, it, it can carry you a long way. So I, I push that a lot to folks is like, realize that this is the long game. 
Um, don't all of a sudden like find out about financial independence. And next thing you know, you're, you're shoveling 95% of your money into a fund and you're living in your car. That's, that's too extreme. Right. <laughs> um, and then, uh, it, and I love this too, is like every, every time I've listened to you guys, I hear Jamie say, just do something. Right. And, and that carries yes. over both sides of the house. You, you do something like if you can put a hundred dollars a month into your Roth IRA, do it. If you can work out for 10 minutes versus an hour every day, do it, right? It's those little incremental things that are going to really pay off in the end. Um, and then the other one is, is stay the course. So um, I have a good example in this. I'm very fortunate that when I was in college, I got to work for FedEx. Uh, I, was a, uh, I was a truck driver. I was a courier, right? I was a part-time afternoon uh, package pickup um, guy. And, uh, and so as I'm going through school and I'm accumulating all the student loan debt, I was still shoveling money into a 401k because I was, I was playing both sides of the house. Right. And I knew, I knew that they were doing a match, which was incredible. I wanted to take advantage of every bit of that. Um, but as 2008, 2009 came around, you know, as a, as a college student surviving on ramen noodles, I'm, you know, I'm doing everything I can. And all of a sudden I see this 16, 17 thousands of dollars that, you know, I had put into savings all of a sudden become eight or $9,000. Um, it was really, really hard, um, for me to see that, you know, to see my tiny little bank account take such a hit. And, uh, so I, I did what most people would do in that situation. I took my money out, um, cause I was scared. I, uh, I quit putting in the, the monthly, um, the monthly contributions that I had put in. And then next thing I know, you know, the market's on its way back up and I've, I've missed all this, right. I missed the, I missed the train as it came back through. And I, as a matter of fact, in preparation for this, I kind of checked, I was like, you know what, what if. What if I hadn't have done that? Oh no! And I would have tripled my money, right? Yeah. Because the market came back. The market always comes back. Um, and just knowing that and having that that wherewithal to stay the course is so incredibly valuable. Yeah, lots of good stuff in there, Luke. Uh, a couple things. I mean, you mentioned like health is wealth, right? Like you can work so hard at building up a savings rate, you know, building up your asset allocation. You know, okay, I'm seventy percent U.S. stocks, twenty percent bonds, and you know like Jamie and I, like we've got our spreadsheets, right. And it's, it's all figured out. But if you're not healthy enough to enjoy your savings, then it's just like, is, is any of it really worth it? And like you were saying, it's, it's the daily process of, and for a lot of the investing stuff, you can, you can set it up to be automated. So I, you know, for like TSP, you can set up your, your contributions to be automatic. I know Vanguard has a system where they'll pull money out of your checking account. So you max out your Roth IRA by the end of the year. And it's those small daily investments compounded over long periods of time that produce amazing results, right? Both in in everything, in relationships, in fitness, in finances. And I like what you said about, you know, staying the course. The one other thing I wanted to highlight that that you just talked about was in in marriage or in any kind of relationship, right? Even if you're both naturally frugal people or natural savers, one of you is probably more of a natural saver than the other person. And one of you is probably more of a natural spender than the other person, right? Even if you're both kind of, you know, left or right on on that spectrum. And so playing to your strengths, right? Because you don't want to live a life that is all uh, beans and, and ramen noodles, but you also don't want to live a life where you're living paycheck to paycheck. And so having one spouse who kind of pulls you in the direction of, Hey, let's go, you know, let's go out to dinner tonight, or, you know, let's, let's go have, uh, let's go have a a great vacation. And then have the other spouse kind of pull you in the other direction and and saying, Hey, you know, well, we can cut back in this area where we're not really getting any benefit. You know, maybe you're spending, I don't know, a thousand dollars a month on clothes or whatever. Right. And both of you are like, you know, we just wear the same thing every day anyways, because we live in Hawaii and it's always the same temperature. (laughs) I only so, wear flip flops. I don't need a bunch of shoes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, lots, Slip-ups. lots of great, lots of great points there. Pivoting now to back to your career a little bit. You've been on some amazing deployments and has some awesome TDY opportunities. How have you used those? You know, that's a very military specific thing where you get to go somewhere, maybe a foreign country, maybe in a tax free zone. And you might get additional income as well for, from per diem. So, how do you use those opportunities to accelerate your journey to financial independence? I I remember when I when I first got to Hawaii, I uh, I overheard one of the uh, one of the captains that was in the unit. He was he was talking about he had gone back and kind of looked at like the amount of money that he had made in per diem over like the previous three years, 
and of course like his 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 big statement was where did that go um, <laughs> oh, no. what what had happened with that money right and i know that a lot of a lot of folks in the military don't have always have those opportunities necessarily to go tdy or or, or to uh, or to deploy um uh, in a sense where they can really focus on using that deployment to hone their uh, hone their financial independence goals. Um, however, some folks, they, they can't stop, right? You can't stop going TDY sometimes in certain jobs and certain jobs, um, especially early on in my life with the, like special operations, you, you just deploy all the time. So um, it, it's, it's the ability to like actually sit there and realize that like that is, that is an opportunity that you can take advantage of that will really, really benefit you in the end. So I have always kind of started out with um, using that extra deployment pay, extra TDY pay, a lot of the way that, that you guys sort of preach that, it, it, you know, when you get these extra bonuses in the year or you get your annual um, raises or you're promoted, like treat that money like it, it isn't there, right? Find a, find a path for it, send it, um, send it somewhere so it doesn't find its, uh, find its way uh, out of your pocketbook, right? Um, so, you know, one big thing for me is going on TDYs. I don't, I don't look at the the per diem rate and go, okay, like what can I go, what fun can I go have with this money? Right. Um, I'm still eating as though I were at home, you know, you still have to feed yourself. Right. Uh, but you don't have to take every dollar that's, uh, that's probably going to be added to your paycheck and just really spend it extravagantly. Um, and, but at the same time, I'm also not just sitting in a room. Right. So we have a lot of us that have to go TDY or, or deploy, you have the opportunity to travel the world at the government's expense, right? And they're going to send you, you know, again, early in my career to some less uh, less uh, ideal places. But then later on, uh, I've been able to go to some really amazing locations just by the nature of what we do. So obviously taking advantage of that. Um, and everywhere you go, there's, there's so many opportunities to do things that don't just drain your bank account. You can go hiking and uh, experience like cultural events and go see places. Um, a lot of times when we're in these foreign countries, or, or even if you're on a stateside TDY, um, find your little find your little bubble. Go out and you know venture out in the area that you're in and explore and learn that area um, for better or worse. Right? Jamie and I are in Alabama, which you know it probably doesn't <laughs> top speed. You know nobody would go, hey, would you rather go to Hawaii or Alabama? But in doing so, there's all sorts of things to see and do in the areas around and to take advantage of that's really, really important. Um, so I was, I would say, yes, I was probably frugal with a little bit of the per diem that would come in. Um, deployments is a totally different ball ballgame. Um, when I was uh, special operations, obviously young lieutenant, tons of uh, student loan debt. So I was really, really focused on that early on, which is good because kind of what we talked about earlier with the psychology of money, it was more important for me to get away from that debt than it was to necessarily, you know, start stocking the, uh, the retirement funds, which is good. Um, once all that was cleared though, it was game on. Right. And, um, the deployment structure back then was a little sporadic. Um, there wasn't necessarily a, uh, you know, a defined, like you're going to go and come back at these kind of times. And I know that that sounds wild to some people in some career fields, but, uh, it was just sort of the nature of the mission back in those days. But, um, my more recent, uh, deployment was, you know, I knew well in advance I was going. I knew well in advance the um, the extra benefits that I was going to receive and the locations that I was going. And so I was able to like come up with a solid financial plan. Um, I was able to start go uh, you know to go ahead and start saving extra money to provide obviously for the basic bills and your family while uh, while you're while you're deployed. But at the same time, I could go ahead and sort of say, well, okay, savings deposit program, right? You guys have talked about this in your deployment uh, episode. Um, combat zone tax exemption the ability to put in uh, tax exempt uh, TSP contributions. And I, and I came up with a really good game plan before I'd left. And I actually, I reached out to one of your former guests, uh, Doug Nordman, who is uh, nice. Spencer lovingly refers to as the OG of military finance. And he truly is uh, yeah, big, uh, big props to Doug. Thank you so much. Cause Doug, uh, Doug really understands the system. He has a working relationship with a lot of these folks that are involved with TSP, the DFAS, the, the whole organization. And he's able to, basically was able to see like exactly what I uh, was, you know, was coming up on and knowing that I'm trying to make a plan. And he said, Hey, um, by the way, I have this article, right. And it discusses exactly what you're doing. So um, I think it was uh, in either an episode you guys did last week or the week prior, where you talk about lump sum uh, and you talk about, you know, is it, is it better to do dollar cost averaging or lump summing? And, and, you know, it's almost negligible, right? Spencer, you kind of mentioned that with your with your nerdery math that you came up to <laughs> about, you know, it's almost the same, right? But I've always been, again, a psychological part of the money is I love, 
I love saving up the year prior. And when that January comes around, I'm like, boom, Roth TSP is good. Or sorry, Roth IRAs are good. Uh, you know, putting all the extra money that um, I'm going to put into like children's educational funds for the next year. And then uh, I'll front load, you know, Roth TSP is a, a, I've kind of failed to mention this earlier, but I'm, I'm so late in the game, right? I hate to call myself an old guy, but I'm a, I'm, you know, I've gotten up in the ranks that I had the option to do either blended retirement or stick with uh, a stick with the legacy system. And because of the commitments that I've, uh, I've given to the air force, I'm going to end up being in for over 16 years regardless. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'll go legacy. I'll do the cliff vesting for 20 years and just, and just stick it out. And so, uh, so I don't have to do dollar cost averaging when it comes to a Roth TSP. So I, I just go in there and whatever those percentages will take, I, I put them in, I let that money just come out uh, early in the year. Well, in my, uh, in my previous deployment, the, the most recent deployment, uh, I had front loaded that year, right? So, um, our, uh, our elected deferral limit was already met. I found out I'm going to deploy and I'm like, well, obviously you want to find a way to save, right? You want to continue to save. Um, so Doug had some really good pointers. Uh, with the uh, annual additional limit, you you need to be in a deployed combat zone location in order to put money there. Um, so uh, so I did. I just said, you know, how do I max this out? And uh, I get into theater. I, I, you know, I fill out all the proper paperwork. I, I let them know, hey, take everything out of my paycheck that you can for uh, savings deposit. Take out everything you can for the additional limits. And uh, I think I, I told you guys that I think in December of that year, right, I deployed over a, over a holiday period. So between two calendar years, I had a a paycheck that was one hundred and fifty eight dollars, right? and that that made me feel so, it was I was so happy, right? That would terrify most people, but I was like, yes, it's like I am sending all my money to all the places I want it to be. Um, so that that was really good, and just to you know, kind of I guess refresh this too on on, on this year. If a, if an individual, we know that the elected deferral limits for twenty twenty two are about twenty thousand five hundred dollars. If you are going to deploy, you have the ability to go up to the sixty one thousand dollars if your lifestyle and if your uh if your uh, uh your actual income your actual income yeah there we go if, if your, your cash actual, flow allows if it. your cash flow allows yeah. it there you go uh, but that all starts with a plan right so you gotta you gotta start early thinking about those things uh and then you gotta be able to like actually execute when the time comes a couple of things there uh that you talked about luke was when you're on tdy and you're getting this you know additional income i think it's a great opportunity to to have a little bit of balance. You can go out with your buddies one night, you know, and and go to a nice steakhouse and, you know, spend all your per diem for that day. But then maybe the next day you just go for a hike and it's peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the room. And you, you can kind of bounce between those two extremes or you can just kind of like, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a health or a fitness goal and you're just, you know, you, you're trying to hit your macros and you're just, you're gonna be eating your protein and you've, you know, maybe you meal prepped and you've brought a lot of food on the, uh, on the road with you. It's you can just like do you travel with me. It's been <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen a, a time or two before, <laughs> but you know, and like we were in uh, Korea on the, on that TDY that one time. And I think uh, you might talk about that a little bit later when we talk about space. A you were there with your family, but we went to that festival in that nearby town and that, you know, that was completely free. I think we got maybe, you know, spent $10 on street food and Absolutely. that was, it was, a, it was an amazing experience such an incredible experience. And that's, I, I think that that's exactly the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make with that one is, you know, there are, there are bars everywhere you go, right? There are the basic restaurants everywhere you go. Um, chilies. Chilies. <laughs> yeah. Got to hit your chilies. Right. But, but to have those kind of experiences, yeah. Like, just like you said, you can come out of pocket 20, $30 and have an incredibly immersed cultural experience in some of these places that we have the opportunity to go. I think it's, it's such an amazing opportunity. We, when, when we were in Eastern Europe, uh, one deployment, um, I, maybe it was back before deployments to Eastern Europe were cool. I guess I'll say that. But uh, one of the one of the things we love to do when we had downtime was free walking tours. A lot of like, I guess, nonprofit or historical agencies will give free walking tours. And so for the cost of a, a tip for the for the uh, lady or the gentleman doing the tour, you can learn all about the city and walk around, you know, a couple miles for a couple hours or whatever. And that's a really incredible way to 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 experience your location without having to spend a bunch of money too. 
Yeah, we did one in uh, Sevilla. It was it was a bike tour, and I think it was like twenty euros. And they advertised it as being three hours. It ended up, ended up being five hours. We were on wow. this bike with this guy. He like took us back to his house. He like took us to his favorite <laughs> tapas bar Siesta in the middle. Of the- yeah, we met his mother. I mean, it was like it was the most immersive experience anyone's ever had for twenty euros. It was uh, it was fantastic. Uh, another thing you mentioned there, Luke, was uh, student loan debt. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind getting into the specifics a little bit about it. So what dollar amount did you have oh, coming absolutely. out and yeah, what was so, your, what was your strategy to pay it off? So I, uh, I kind of had it, I kind of had a twofer. Um, I had begun flying as a civilian pilot while in college, um, had caught the bug very early on. Um, I had also had, you know, I can't even remember who was who inspiring me to do this, but it was, it said, you know, Hey, follow your, your passion for aviation, but also, attempt to get a degree in something in case, you know, uh, it, we're never guaranteed, um, you know, health and, and longevity in the aviation world. So have something to fall back on. So uh, I kind of did a, a two front attack uh, with, uh, with my um, education at that time. So I, I got an engineering degree. And at the same time, I was flying at a civilian uh, aviation academy, uh, went to a state school, I got scholarships early on. Um, I was one of those guys, though, that I loved everything so much that I had to switch my major about 10 times. Uh, so I, I really discovered myself and, uh, in doing so, I think I got about $25,000 in, in student loans, quite the, quite the expensive discovery effort. Um, also pretty much had almost the exact same in aviation loans, if not just a bit wow. more. So I was, I was well into the, uh, the mid to low 50,000 range, um, came on active duty, uh, as I said, an OTS. And so, uh, back then, um, they had the career starter loan was $25,000 and the rate was incredibly low. So I said, well, I need to start consolidating. So I took that 25,000, I, I threw it at some of the, uh, higher interest loans that I had. And then, uh, like most of us, I feel like a lot of us get started in the Dave Ramsey world. Um, that's at least where you get your, uh, your, you know, your, your element, you know, your basic education yeah. with uh, financial independence and, um, again, it was, uh, it was a psychological thing for me. I wanted to, I wanted to have less places to have to pay my student loans. So I found the, I did the, uh, the snowball method, right? I found the little one and I took it out and then I took that money and I took it to the next one. Um, I, uh, I had the, the good fortune that I was, I was deployed a lot. I was, a, you know, single at the time. So I had the ability to just throw everything I had at my, at my loans. And, uh, it was it was incredibly rewarding to ha- be able to pay off that amount of of student debt in well under a year and a half, um, just by getting you know just almost wow. tenacious in, yeah. in paying those off. Yeah, that's fantastic. We've got a episode, I believe, Jamie. I can't remember which number it is. Maybe number nine on uh, career star loans. We'll have to go look that one up and uh, and link to it. But. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's a fantastic opportunity for anybody coming out of ROTC, the academy. You know, in the academy, it's 075 percent, so that's wow. that's an, that's an insanely low amount there. But there's a lot of mistakes that you can make with that loan too. So go listen to that episode if you are eligible. And I think usually it's you're within a a year or two of of commissioning. Jamie, what number was it? Yeah, number nine is correct. Yeah, you're number nine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've got that. Uh, I've got that memory. <laughs> so, uh, Luke, you also enjoy traveling. We mentioned this already, and recently you had a pretty cool uh, travel hacking trip to Chicago. Can you share some details about uh, that, specifically that that trip to Chicago? And if you want to get into other travel hacking uh, wins, feel oh, free. Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah. So, uh, obviously, the premise of this episode, Space A. I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of that shortly. But in the uh, in the interim, since Space A has been uh, has been kind of uh, discontinued until further notice, thanks to COVID, um, I've gotten more into the actual credit card hacking, travel hacking side of the house, and uh, it, it's actually um, it's turned out it's been a little bit easier uh, now that we're back in the continental United States to try to find ways to to get around and do little short trips that that. Um, that you can use credit card points for, or some of the other benefits. Um, I was really proud. And I think you guys mentioned a couple episodes ago and a, a little shout out about yeah, yeah. Uh, my anniversary trip with my wife, but we, uh, we were going to Chicago. And so obviously the first thing I do is start figuring out how I can combine points and rewards to, to make this, uh, to make this the, uh, the most frugal, uh, advantageous way to get out there. Um, at the time, so obviously, as any good credit card hacker, uh, not quite as uh, as sophisticated as you guys, but we have a pretty good uh, selection to choose from. I've got the uh, the Amex Platinum, 
I've got the, uh, um, the Delta Amex. And so this one was a little bit unique in that I believe before Christmas in 2021, uh, Amex Platinum, just in their normal offers, had said, hey, if you spend $300 uh, on, a, on a Delta flight, uh, we'll take like 140 or 160 yeah. off. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, and uh, so I was like, okay, noted. Uh, and then because I have the Delta Amex, um, we have the companion pass associated with that. So I was able to get in there, um, applied the companion pass, then turned around and applied the uh, the Platinum Amex to it. And uh, long story short, it ended up being uh, about $25 a ticket uh, for Comfort Plus for me and my wife to get out there, which was, I was proud of myself, right? Little small victories. Yeah, that's little, pretty good. Little wins. Uh, we, we stayed at a Marriott while we were there. And because I have the Marriott Amex, uh, I had booked that uh, using military government rate. And uh, ended up getting about half of the uh, the entire cost back on that one because of their uh, their three hundred dollar annual benefit as well on that card. So um, all the small victories. Wife thinks uh, thinks I'm ridiculous for it, but uh, I'm glad to be here among friends and able to <laughs> able to express the excitement that I had over over those little wins. So before joining the military, you mentioned you worked for FedEx a little bit. Did you have any travel hacking bug or experience? before all the military benefits of credit card rewards and things like that? Oh yeah. This was uh, FedEx was definitely my first introduction to uh, finding ways in order to, to travel on the cheap. Um, kind of like I mentioned before, uh, part-time courier while I'm in college. Um, it was an incredible, incredible company to work for. The benefits were, were really, really good for a guy that's just able to, you know, work afternoons after classes. But one of the um, probably one of the more exciting benefits that came from that was uh, the ability as an airline employee, as being a, you know, even though I'm just driving a truck around town, picking up boxes, they still considered, you know, you're part of the airline uh, structure. So I was able to acquire these uh, Z fares or what they call non-rev tickets, uh, which basically, um, and I know folks that, that work for airline industry out there definitely understand these, but they're, you pay the taxes and the fees, um, and then you go sit standby um, with whichever airline you've kind of chosen. So, um, Super fortunate again, you know, work hard during the week, weekends would come around. Um, I would get these, I would just always kind of have one of these tickets available. And this is, this is back in the day when they actually physically <laughs> sent you a ticket. It was like, there's, you know, very few people had, if you had an email, it probably had something associated with America online, but, uh, they, uh, they would send you these tickets for 30 plus dollars. And then, uh, you go list yourself at the counter and you, you travel kind of wherever you want. So as a, you know, again, a broke college student, this was very exciting. I ended up uh, I took trips to Connecticut and Las Vegas and Tampa and Detroit and kind of all over the U.S. to sort of visit friends, uh, leave on like a Friday, come back on a Sunday night, back uh, back at work at school by the next Monday. So uh, it really ended up laying a pretty solid foundation for what I was uh, expecting to, to end up doing once I got into to space A travel, once I discovered that years and years later. So, yeah, I think so much about travel hacking or taking advantage of all these different programs is just having the flexibility and doing it a couple of times, you get comfortable with it and realizing like, it's not scary. Uh, and if you screw it up, like worst case scenario, you're just stuck somewhere nice for, you know, a, or not so nice, but you're just stuck somewhere for <laughs> a, a couple of days and, and that's it, right? Like there's the, the downside is, is maybe a, you lose a little bit of your time. You waste a little bit of your time, but the upsides can be, can be incredible. And especially when you're, you know, a broke college student, or let's say that you're, you know, an airman or a soldier, you know, uh, E3, E4, and you're not making that much money, you're living in the dorms, but you're stationed in Europe. When Space A comes back, I know guys who like hit 30 countries uh, from from Germany, and they did that in, th wow. in three years. And just every four day weekend, they would just go to the terminal and, okay, where's the next C-17 going? Where's the next C-5 going? Well, the C-5 is probably not going anywhere, but... <laughs> <laughs> Luke, in uh, episode 29 of the podcast, Jamie and I talked about circuitous travel when you PCS overseas. And before the episode, you and I were talking about you, you've got an upcoming PCS to Korea. Are you guys planning on taking circuitous travel on the way to Korea? Oh, absolutely. Um, so we've taken advantage of circuitous travel every time we've gone back and forth overseas. So uh, obviously to and from Hawaii. Um, my assignment, and this is part of, uh, you know, my, we're, we're super thrilled about it. This is part of our Air Force story is we, uh, I'll be going on, on a one-year remote, um, which lots and lots of families do. Uh, Air Force, Army, um, a lot of times in Korea, they're oftentimes people don't have the option. They, they have to do this. Um, 
we were we were very interested in it. We obviously that you just talked about the flexibility, and you, you need to have you obviously need to have a family who's willing and 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 eager to do eager to do an assignment like that to make it worthwhile. But um, normally we would have gotten circuitous travel and taken a few days off and traveled here or there, you know, uh, and made our way over. Uh, the unique situation with this trip is that I have to find a way to get the family there, uh, which is another reason that credit card hacking and travel hacking has been phenomenally beneficial for us is that I had the Sky Miles uh, available and uh, got them a flight over. Um, once I uh, got my circuitous travel approved, uh, I would just, same as I would with any other PCS, just booked a ticket um, on my own and then I'll be accompanying them sitting right next to them, right? So uh, it ended up being a, a fantastic event. Uh, or a fantastic opportunity for us, I should say. Um, so, you know, to have them fly with me and me not have to get on some kind of rotator and end up landing right at the base. And then my, my wife trying to find her way from the airport down, which um, she's absolutely uh, 100% capable of, but it just makes life so much easier, right? To have that opportunity right. available. Um, we're able to take, you know, we're able to take leave uh, for at least a couple of days and go back home and see some family on the way out. So, so to have those options uh, and opportunities are just it, it, pretty incredible. Yeah, circuitous travel. Um, like you said, episode twenty nine, we talked all about that. is is a really nice benefit coming to or from uh, an overseas assignment. You mentioned that you guys had visited Korea uh, via Space A a couple times. So let's transition a little bit and talk about um, Space A. Uh, I, I said earlier in the episode that you guys have saved uh, over forty one thousand dollars in travel expenses using Space A benefits, which is incredible. So we want to just kind of dig into that and see exactly what those benefits are and some of the tactical and practical ways of, of signing up for travel and how to take advantage of that, hopefully when it does come back soon. Uh, but first, let's start like space available or space A. What What is that overall concept if someone's never heard of it before? So space available travel, um, obviously military, lots of planes moving around the globe, right? So the DOD established a program as a benefit to um, all the people that are eligible for space available travel, which we can talk about in a minute, that when there are open seats on an aircraft and it's going to a location that will allow uh, someone to, to travel. So I'm specifically, you know, when you, when you think about the fact that a C-17 flies from the East coast and there, maybe they were going to the middle East to, to some unsavory places, they're going to have to stop somewhere on the way. They're going to have to stop in Germany. They're going to stop in Spain. They're going to stop in England. Um, the DOD will allow you to utilize empty seats on a space available basis to get to those locations. If you so choose um, a tremendous benefit, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited about $30, uh, non-rev tickets that get me around the United States. Well, the military travels all over the world. The United States military is, is covering the Pacific, covering the Atlantic and going to just some tremendously incredible locations that even though your travel desires may not necessarily take you to that specific spot, it's going to get you close, mm. um, to where you can kind of forward hop from there. So, Again, I, I see it as a great benefit that uh, that a lot of people and, and, and I know Spencer kind of alluded to this. They they they're aware that this exists, but maybe they're scared. Maybe they're nervous. They don't have quite the the amount of information that they need to, to be able to take advantage. Uh, but just a tremendous, tremendous uh, resource. So who's eligible for Space A? Is it just about everybody in the military, dependents? What are, like contracted so, ROTC cadets, academy, right? So my understanding on this is, uh, for the most part, uh, active duty service members are, are, are covered. Um, I believe with Guard and Reservists, you would most likely need to be on orders for greater than 30 days to be eligible. But there's kind of a, that's a unique situation. It's like you'd have to put them on reserve regard orders and then for having them turn around and take, take leave, leave would be kind of strange. So th those are a little bit more unique situations. Um, your families are, are allowed to accompany you. So you're talking, the dependents that are listed um, with, you know, with, uh, um, like in deers in deers exactly um retirees and, and i know you guys kind of talk about this as, as uh you know having seen a lot of these folks that are at the uh, space uh, space a terminals uh, a lot of times retirees are there but they're there because they have that flexibility that everybody really wants um and then uh, i had to do a little little uh professor google research on this one but um it is it's contracted cadets um so not folks that are taking rotc classes but the ones that are actually contracted they themselves are eligible to take advantage of space available once it, once it does return. Yeah, we, we actually have, um, not, not great space A experience like you do, but a little bit. And when, when my wife was a contracted cadet, I had already commissioned, but she was still in ROTC. There was a, um, C-17 that left from Jackson, Mississippi 
to Andrews every week to start an, an air medical evacuation mission. They left every Sunday. So she got to ride to and from between uh, Jackson, Mississippi and, and Andrews a bunch as a contracted cadet. Um, and so that was kind of cool, uh, kind of a random little mission there that we were able to take advantage of. We've we've ridden Space A once from Andrews back to Travis, um, which worked out. And then my family has come along Space A from Hawaii to California and back with me. That one was a disaster. And then, <laughs> and then they've tried a couple other times where they didn't make the cut. So the sign up process and the flexibility, like you said, is important. But uh, yeah, it's it, it can be tough sometimes. That's definitely something to consider, right? So as we've traveled around and the more we've done Space A and, and talked to folks that it, you, you get one or two experiences out the gate. Um, either it's the smoothest experience, much like going out and getting on an airline and, and you show up right on time and everything goes real easy or it's a disaster and, and you're not ready for it, right? So I think, you know, as most of your listeners are, you're military, right? So we know we know what hurry up and wait's all about. We know... <laughs> that uh, nothing's guaranteed, right? Nothing is, uh, is written in stone. And so um, some of the biggest advice, and my, my wife, was, she was a great asset uh, out in Hawaii for some of the units that she, she wrote a, a little blurb in the, in the newsletter that talked about mm -hmm. space A travel uh, every few weeks, but she always made sure to talk about the flexibility that's involved with space A travel. So um, I wouldn't say that we have, we've never, <laughs> we've never, uh, had flawless space A experiences, right? And that's, that's just the reality. And that's, that's something, it's a mindset, right? You need to have that mindset going into it that, uh, you get what you're paid for, right? So if it's, if it's free 99 and you're hopping on a, a, a C-130 or a C-5 or, or a C-17, um, you know, Spencer alluded to the C-5 might not be taken off. Probably not. Uh, the C-17 probably going to get you where you need to go, right? This, the KC-135, it's going to be cold. There's always going to be these aspects that you um, that you need to consider in, in flexibility of travel. And um, one thing I wanted to hit on too is, uh, you, you know, we get to tell all these stories. It's kind of like the uh, the Instagram of, of our life of, of doing some space A travel is, well, nobody sees, nobody sees everything that went into it ahead of time. And I, I've had four instances where, when I took leave, I was going to go to Australia, Space A, and four separate times, I never went to Australia, right? <laughs> so we, we've we ended up in some great locations, and that goes into uh, the preparation phase, too, of, of saying, well, um, you know, you're going to have some time off. Like, you want to travel somewhere, right? Have have three or four options and, uh, and go through those as if that were the location that you're going to go see. Um, you know, make out daily itineraries, do all those kind of things, and... Uh, and look at it from a realistic perspective of, okay, uh, we live in Delaware, right? So Dover's got flights going out all the time, or, or maybe you can just drive up the road to McGuire or maybe over to, to BWI and try to catch one of these hops. And okay, we want to go to France, right? Well, if a flight's going to Germany or Spain, you can obviously get to France. So, so, uh, you know, come up with those, those kind of plans. The Pacific was a little different, right? There's a, a whole lot of water and not a whole lot of land out there. So, um, when these, when these trips would fall through, you know, I'm already on leave. I've already taken this time off. Well, uh, Australia didn't work out. So we said, we're going to go to Korea. So that's how we ended up in Korea the first time. Uh, the next time, uh, we're going to get on this flight to Australia. That didn't happen. We ended up in Okinawa for a week and that, that ended up being an amazing trip. Uh, had a fantastic time. Um, the next time it's California, right? The next time it's Alaska, but it's always, we're always flexible to the point where we're not so hard and fast that this is the location we want to go. we We've just taken the time. We've prepped for all these like tertiary, secondary plans that we can end up doing, and uh, and it ended up being it ended up being great experiences all around. It, no matter how painful it is, but never never forget that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> but I forget that there was another time too. We tried to space a out of Hawaii, and it ended up we we made it on a uh, KC one thirty five, one of the tankers, and up to engine start, and we heard this like really loud noise. <laughs> and what they said, basically, we did not, they then had to cancel the flight because of maintenance, but uh, someone like took out the ground power unit without like turning it off first and like fried the whole electrical system or something oh. along those lines. And we're just sitting oh. there like, oh, we were so close. Oh. <laughs> um, you mentioned a lot of the unpredictability of, you know, mission could get recut, the plane could divert for maintenance and wherever that plane lands, exactly. you're, you're done. But you also hinted at a BWI. So there's, you can go to Seattle or you can go to Baltimore and there's a little bit more structured flights sometimes uh, that we'll, you often hear called as rotators. Can you talk a little bit about those? Absolutely. So so um, we have contracted carriers that for the locations that are very, uh, for example, Korea, right, is a is a location that especially during the summer time frame, 
we're moving a lot of soldiers, troops in and out of those areas. And so it's become so much of a demand signal that we need a predictive contracted air carrier. So as you kind of mentioned, um, SeaTac in Seattle is one of them. Um, they have a couple of different routes that'll take them out through the Pacific, um, usually hit mainland Japan, sometimes Okinawa, and then uh, over to Korea. And then the same thing on the other side with uh, Baltimore, Washington International. So at the international airport, we have, you know, government contracted aircraft that are, that are taking folks either PCSing families to Germany uh, or England or um, taking, taking soldiers and troops down uh, downrange to the Middle East. Um, and so, again, a lot of this goes into kind of the research and, and, and knowing a specific passenger terminals of like you can start studying. And this is this is like the, the prep phase of this. You can start studying and seeing, oh, OK, well, on Tuesdays, they, they they'll fly between here and England. Right. And so you just sort of understand that there's a rhythm to it. Um, and with any travel, right, any any leisure travel, highly recommend not going during the peak seasons because <laughs> you're going to have a much more difficult time. And this is this is why that uh, you'll always see the, the retirees around during the, you know, when school's in session, uh, they're already ready to go because for a, for a lot of families, they can't they can't take their, uh, their kids out of school for that, that period of time. Um, so for us, a lot of the prep work went back to uh, you know, so where's your base station, right? What's the closest thing to you? And in Hawaii, you have basically Hickam. Um, that's going to be, you know, the, the place to go. And so you start to learn that, well, okay, every two weeks, this flight might happen and every three weeks. And so you can sort of kind of prog out sometimes uh, where you think trips might go that are more routine. Um, and then the other times you could just roll the dice, right? So again, uh, using Hawaii as an example, if someone takes off from Hawaii, they're going to end up most likely in a Guam, a California. You know, there's only so many places that you you can initially go on that first hop. And so if you use that as like a planning metric, you can go, OK, well, we can at least get here and then we'll figure it out from there. Um, I will backtrack a little bit and tell you one of the better lessons that I ever learned. And I want to make sure all of the listeners are, are writing this down because uh, we... It, it ended up being a great experience, but we learned it the hard way. So our, our very first um, full uh, space available trip, we went to uh, Yokota, Japan. So we got to go to Tokyo, had an amazing experience, did all the things, uh, Tokyo Disneyland. We were, we were down just seeing the entire city. Um, and so I, again, I had, you know, the way we, you know, all three of us are, is I've got the, my spreadsheet that tells me here's all the planes, <laughs> you know, here's all the expected dates that these planes are going to leave from here, here. Well, we show up at Yokota, ready to come home, uh, and uh, against better judgment, it was a C-5 uh, reserve unit, and uh, I was like, oh, this is going to be fantastic. We're going to take us straight back to Hawaii. Uh, the bus takes us out to the aircraft. We stop in front of the aircraft, and the bus drives away. We go back to the terminal, uh, and of course, it's a C-5, so it's broken, and uh, so I had met, a, had met a friend in the terminal who's a uh, um, career Navy, and he this guy knew space a, right. So, uh, he was super expert on this. So he's already looking at all the schedules. He's like, okay, the tomorrow there's three flights leaving from here. They're going to Travis, California, uh, from Travis, there's three flights leaving the next day going to Hawaii. And we're like, we're connecting the dots. Right. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm just going to ride on this guy's coattails. Uh, what a genius. So sure enough, uh, the next day we go to Travis and, uh, we say hi to Hawaii as we fly over on the way, <laughs> on the way to Travis, get out to California. Uh, we get to Travis and uh, so when you sign up for Space A, you have to send out your request form to every terminal you can anticipate traveling through. Well, obviously, going to Japan from Hawaii, I never thought in a million years, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely end up in California. Uh, so we ended up in California. And when you show up day of, you're you are the bottom on the list for uh, for sign up dates because you just showed up there. So we we missed the first two flights that day. We, we luckily made it back that night. It was a it was a pretty exhausting, you know, 36, 40, uh, 40 hour trip that we had. But uh, those little lessons um, that need to be need to be like committed to memory when it comes to space. A, if, if you think it's even remotely possible that you could end up at this terminal, you better send a request out to them as soon as you have your leave orders. Or if your family station overseas, they often can travel without you. Uh, they get a they get a letter from their commander, um, which I can talk a little bit more about that. They. Uh, you can send that letter out very, very early, but make sure you list every single email uh, address possible for those space available terminals. Yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of gotchas there. One thing I just want to hit on it: it's not just an Air Force program, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's Navy planes like the C forty, which is a seven thirty seven uh, passenger platform, basically, which is a great way to travel. Um, and so there's other. It, all service members can do it. All retirees can do it, and it's not just the Air Force thing, but. 
Air Mobility Commander, AMC, um, or you'll hear the uh, old retired guy say Mac, Mac. the Mac planes <laughs> uh, just have the most um, options and the most flights. Uh, so it's not just for retirees, not just for Air Force uh, families. Um, you mentioned the upcoming schedules and kind of digesting of what the options are and what's coming up. Can you talk a little bit about where you see them? They used to be on Facebook, but I understand they're moving. Exactly. They, uh, so, um, again, I like to say back in the day, but this was pre COVID two years ago. So not, not quite back in the day, right? So, um, you would basically have to go on Facebook and like, or follow every passenger terminal, um, that you would potentially use. And then they would post continued schedules throughout the day of, of predicted flights for the next 72 hours. Um, and a lot of times they'll, they'll put obviously location that they're going time of the roll call, and then they'll put tentative seats available on the airplane. Um, and they're going now AMC in February, I believe February 28th, they were requiring that all passenger terminals would migrate to, uh, the AMC, uh, travel page is what they call it now. Um, it's, uh, you can easily Google AMC's space available travel page. Um, it should be one of the first ones that pop up, but it now has centralized, uh, centralized location for all, um, hmm. all passenger terminals, at least on the AMC side. And as Jamie just mentioned, um, sometimes there's Navy bases that will, uh, they're outside of the air, you know, the air forces, air mobility community that don't post necessarily on this. And, you, and that, in those situations, you would probably still need to follow their, uh, their Facebook pages. Uh, but it, I've gone on, uh, obviously space available travel, uh, current as of the recording is still not uh, going on, uh, at least for leisure travel. Uh, but I've gone on, I've, I've checked out kind of how it's, it's going and, and, and keep in mind that there's still passenger terminal people there now. So these, this is actively being used. Uh, there is a method that you can uh, sign up for your home terminal so electronically. So it's without email, but um, I would always double tap that one. So sign up on the website, if you will, but also also send the emails. Um, there's a link on the page as well that has all the contact information for all the terminals. They break it down into regions. Um, so if you're going to Europe, uh, it'll have all the, the UCOM regions in there. If you're going out to the Pacific, you want to get to Hawaii or Japan or Korea, there's a, there's a PACOM uh, area to that. Um, and while I'm kind of talking about that piece too, the, uh, the sign up aspect of it. So when you're, when you're an active duty person, uh, station either CONUS uh, or uh, in Alaska and Hawaii, when you sign up for space available travel, it occurs, you're able to send that email, if you will, when uh, when your leave starts. Uh, and not before. Not before. Yeah. No, they'll, they'll kick it back. They won't even, they won't even allow you to, um, to, to put in your, uh, your initial request for basically, it's basically a timestamp that, that gives you priority over the next category of individuals. Um, so when you're stateside, Alaska, Hawaii, you'll be category three typically with the service member traveling. Um, we were also very fortunate that while we're in Hawaii, um, and this goes for Alaska as well, that your, your spouse um, is able to travel without you. Uh, they'll be traveling as a category five. And the way that works, um, and you can Google, um, Google search how to get a command sponsor letter for, for space available travel. And there's plenty of templates out there that you can use, but um, the active duty member, uh, service members commander would have to sign this form. It would list all the uh, dependents on the, on the form itself. That, that specific letter is good for 90 days from the signature. However, when you email that letter to a terminal, it's good in their system for 60 days. So that's, that sometimes can get confusing for folks. And obviously the, the 90 is just to give the commander time to sign it, give it time to get back to you. And then you're able to email that letter out. And then that establishes your level of priority there at, at category five. Um, there's also uh, there's also an element called um, environmental morale leave uh, EML, which is primarily for folks that are in uh, a little more um, austere locations. Sometimes I believe all of Korea is, is considered this. I may, I may be wrong on that one, but uh, what it will do is if you're, you're able to take either once, in a one year, twice in two years, or three in three years, if you will, uh, the ability to basically travel back stateside and it bumps you to the next category. So an active duty service member would be able to be category two at that point for EML. Um, and then if your spouse is traveling without you from such locations, they would actually bump to category four. Um, so little nuances, a lot of things to Google and research uh, for, for what specific category you're in, but just understanding that those categories exist. And the way that that works is once you get to the terminal, uh, you would mark yourself present for, you know, hey, I, I want to compete for this flight. That way they're not going through a, a list of thousands of people who've sent them emails in the past two or three months. And then uh, they'll go, they'll start with, you know, category one. And those are the people that, that need to get home for an emergency situation. And then they go down the list of cat two, cat three. 
um, and whatever seats are available, uh, that's that's what's available. By that sign up date from when you exactly. sent the email. Yeah. So. yeah, exactly. So you um, you mentioned there's a lot of um, the different categories. I'm just going to read through them real quick. You, some of these you mentioned just to summarize. Category one is emergency leave, like you mentioned. Category two is accompanied environmental and morale leave, which is accompanied by the service member. Category three is regular ordinary leave, active duty, traveling, um, house hunting, permissive TDY, and a couple other random things like Medal of Honor holders. Um, I don't know if I have a Medal of Honor, I'm probably not space hanging around, but it, it's category, I guess. Uh, category four is unaccompanied EML, environmental and morale leave. Category five, uh, permissive TDY, non-house hunting, students, dependents, post-deployment mobilization, some other random categories. And then category six is where most of the retirees contracted ROTC cadets and, and things like that fall. So if you show up as a active duty service member on leave, you're going to be category three and all the retirees that are there, category six. So you can see that you're going to have priority over them. Uh, depending on the number of seats are available, they'll go down the list by category, by uh, sign up date, basically is how it works. Exactly. And, and other little things to keep in mind with this is, um, uh, this is a little bit comical, but every person that you bring with you with your dependents is a real person. So unlike the airline where you have a lap baby, uh, yeah. a one-year-old on a space available flight takes a seat and they need to be in like a car seat. And you can't choose to not have a you seat. You can't for them. choose to not have a seat for them, uh, <laughs> as much as you would like. Um, you know, they, they absolutely require those things. So, uh, that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and then the way that you, uh, the way you prepare yourself. So obviously like day of travel, you gotta, you gotta be there early. I, we always recommend to be in there well more than an hour before the, the roll call itself, because as we kind of know, uh, things are subject to change. Rarely do timelines go left, but you never know. Right. So, so better be safe than sorry. Um, show up plenty early. And, uh, and, and we, we learned this very early in the game. I mean, we've, we've probably done space a 15 times. And uh, I remember the first three or four times my, my poor wife and I were, you know, we're dragging car seats and, and bags, and we had just tremendous amounts of luggage to drag around the world. And we got really, really good about minimizing what you bring with you. You know, for the most part, you're going to end up uh, at a location that has, uh, you know, air, you know, Air Force or military facilities. So um, you don't have to pack for a third, you know, like you're going to be there for 30 or 40 <laughs> days. There's there's obviously a lot of places that you can use laundry at, at uh, military hotels when you're when you're traveling overseas or or even back to the States. Look, I've got uh, two tactical questions for you. One, the first one is hotel booking. So when you're applying this flexible travel style to space, a, are you just showing up and then hoping for the best for hotels? A, a lot of times you, you do need to kind of wing it. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's the part that makes people really nervous, right? Um, very rarely have we ever shown up somewhere where we were just at a complete loss for where are we going to stay, right? Um a lot of the locations you think about, think about Germany and England and, and Japan, we have a, a large military presence there. So first off, we're going to have some type of military in, whether it be Air Force ends, uh, something along those lines. We also, and again, all of us, you know, being travel hackers that we are, you're going to have some points accumulated, hopefully for certain hotels that are, are pretty uh, prevalent in overseas locations. So uh, always, always keep a stash of some Hilton points uh, laying around in case you, you have to make like a last minute booking and you're not just having to pay completely uh, out of pocket for some of these, for some of these locales. But um, it's, it's really good to not uh, obviously book hotels in foreign countries, especially um, where you don't have an, an easy or a flexible way to cancel. Um, and, uh, and that, that's just always something to keep in mind is just, you know, kind of, kind of hope for the best. Um, we would specifically with, with our travels of, of, say we'll use Tokyo, for instance, we would try to depart two or three days prior to a hotel reservation that we made for a very specific event. Um, and we would be flexible enough to stay maybe at the Air Force Inns for a couple of nights. And then, you know, you take the train or you take the bus downtown and you transition to this is okay. Now we're in vacation mode. Uh, and, but the whole time we, you know, I was telling you earlier, we had those lists of, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that around these certain areas. And so we kind of made geographic lists of the places that we can go and things we can experience sort of in those one or two day buffer periods where we're waiting to, uh, to actually start our full planned up vacation time. Okay. And then my second tactical question is packing. So on a lot of these flights, you know, you're not going to have 
flight attendants. Uh, you're not going to have the lie flat business class seats that I've become accustomed to <laughs> due to all my travel hacking. So what do you, what do you pack? Um, any specific like brands of, or, of equipment and you know, what, what makes the trip more comfortable? And the other thing too, is like you were mentioning earlier, KC-135 gets cold and you know, oh, yeah. the C- C-17 is depending on where you're sitting can be pretty, can be hot or can be cold. Oh, absolutely. So, um, here's, here's kind of a bonus tip too, of, of folks that, that aren't super familiar with, with using space a travel. So when you, when you look at the listing of flights that are coming up, you can sometimes get a read based off of the seats that are tentatively available of what aircraft that's going to be. Um, so C-17, right. It, it typically will say 53 tentative seats in that just gives you an idea is like, okay, that flight that's leaving, going to this location might be a C-17. Or 19. Or 19 yeah. sometimes, depending on it. Right. And and so you get a feel for, you know, okay, we, we started noticing uh, maybe like KC-135s give, they always have 10 tentative seats on there. And then uh, C-5s will have 73. 73. Yep. 73, I think is the number for that one. And that also gives you a good idea in the back of your mind too. Well, you know, as C-17 guys, you realize that like cargo can take those seats away. Um, and oftentimes it does. I have four attempts to go to Australia that prove that, right? So, so uh, we've heard. So, <laughs> I'm not bitter. Uh, but the uh, but the 73 tentative seats on a C5 are always there. Those are those are seats that are up in the upper deck. Uh, cargo can't trump those uh, those seats necessarily. But it's a give and take, right? Because the C5 probably won't take off. So um, you'll be comfortable. You know, C5s are, are fairly comfortable. C17s are obviously the most comfortable airplane out there. Uh, slightly biased. Um, and then as you said, KC-135s are like a thunderstorm in waiting. They have like, uh, it's like 180 degrees by the, by the top of it and like 14 degrees at the floor, you know, they, uh, the, you stand up and it's like super, yeah, it's super, super, uh, uh, divergent in the, in the way that it keeps its, uh, uh, heating and cooling in that aircraft. Um, so those, those give you kind of ideas. And then based off of that, at least on your initial departure, you can kind of pack appropriately for whichever aircraft. So, um, we would always bring, you know, we, we, it's almost like we were packing for, uh, you know, this long distance hiking trip, you know, we would always pack like small, uh, like air up mattresses thing. You, you want to have the ability to have pillows and stuff, which by the way, my wife absolutely, would prefer to fly space available military travel now going across like, especially the Pacific because your ability to lay out on the floor, like you don't have to sit in a seat necessarily, unless it's a C5. Um, it, it, you have the ability to kind of spread out in some of these aircraft. So you, you can make yourself comfortable, uh, you know, in some of the most uncomfortable aircraft that, that are out there. Um, and then in doing so, like have the ability to pack in, in layers. So, you know, bring a light sweatshirt, bring, you know, maybe jackets as necessary. Um, one thing that I really pushed a lot of people uh, early on is to think about the fact that like you need some kind of hearing protection for yourself and, and then obviously children as well too. So we like to take noise canceling headsets, uh, which not only helps with, you know, watching movies or, or listening to music or, or maybe listening to this wonderful podcast while you're <laughs> flying eventually back on space A again. Um, and then bringing chargers on board with you and, and you, in reality, if, if folks have never done this before, it's very, very similar to airline style flying as, as far as once you get there, you can, you can check two, you know, usually two 70 pound bags, you can bring one carry on. It's all those kind of those typical TSA rules that you see for your carry on stuff. It's just bringing the extra few things that you would need for comfort. If you have the ability to kind of lay out. Yeah. I've seen people even have like uh, inflatable air mattresses, pool, pool <laughs> floats, um, we one time, like when my family, like I said, flew from Hawaii to California, they we did in uh, like the rafts, like pool floats, oh, yeah. and just yep. blew those up. And that was like a little air mattress. But I've seen like le- le- legitimate air mattresses in the cargo bay as well. Um, so you mentioned like snacks. Is there an option to buy meals? You, we don't have flight attendants on most of these planes, but what do you do other than just a bunch of granola bars? They they usually do offer you the ability to buy um, uh, what. A lot of us in the military lovingly call box nasties. We have the ability to get those uh, pre-made sandwiches. There's usually a piece of fruit in there. We we typically will bring um, you know our own food. We'll pack up um, at least at least enough to get you through almost an entire day. Because a lot of these trips, um, considering the amount of time that you get before roll call, uh, you know you show up an hour or two before roll call. Roll call is usually sometimes three to three and a half hours before the flight even takes off. And then if some of these flights are you know, upwards of, of seven, eight, eight hours. <laughs> and then, you know, and then by the time, then you got to wait for the bus at the end, there's just a lot of process. And if you have, 
if you have whiny children that get hungry, uh, I highly recommend, you know, having a, enough food for, for a solid day to, to sustain you as you, as you kind of travel through. And then you also have the ability to like pick and choose what you're eating and not necessarily at the whim of, of AMC. So. So Space A, sounds like it's been a huge benefit for you guys. I mean, how did you estimate the $41,000 in free travel? Oh, so, uh, you know, again, back to us being spreadsheet guys, I, uh, <laughs> I, I had to, I had to take a look, you know, I was like, I went back, I kind of saw all the trips that we had done and on a very, very, very conservative level. I said, well, you know, had we bought three one-way trips that went, took us to this location and then, you know, turned around and we went to another location afterwards, um, using just the most basic of, of search engines, you know, I was like, wow, this is, this is at least $40,000 that we've, we've saved over time. Now we've also been very, very fortunate to a couple of times end up on C-37s and C-40s, which is, you know, like being on a private jet. And that is uh, probably not something that most folks will get the opportunity to do. That was, that was sheer luck and timing, but uh, that, those are incredible experiences uh, on those. So I, I, I didn't even account for the fact that, you know, you're on a, you're on almost a, uh, a, a personal business aircraft that's taking you to some of these really amazing locations. Yeah, that's awesome. So I think the uh, two big takeaways I want to share from today's episode, which has been really good, uh, hearing another perspective about financial independence and some personal experience, as well as talking about space, a travel and the incredible benefit that is, uh, first takeaway is kind of your three things you talked about when you tell other people about financial independence, Luke, and to recap, those were simplify, focus on the psychology more than dollars and cents and stay the course. And your big gains are going to come from small daily investments. I think there's definitely a lot of wisdom there. And the second good takeaway from today is that space aid travel. We talked a lot about that. Uh, can be a great benefit for both active duty service members and their families, as well as retirees. But it does require a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of homework uh, ahead of time and throughout the process. So Luke, any other uh, resources you could point people to if they had more questions about space A or if they're interested in giving it a shot their first go? Yeah. Um, now that they've, they've migrated this page, I highly recommend that everyone, um, you know, while things are still suspended due to COVID, get on the uh, AMC uh, space available travel page and kind of click around and make yourself familiar with that and start, start kind of learning like where, uh, you know, where your home base is, is going to take you to and, uh, and, and familiarizing yourself with those schedules. Um, the other place that I would absolutely recommend folks go check out is uh, Pop and Smoke. Um, Stephanie uh, Montague runs a, a, a Facebook page there, and she has some great articles uh, that discuss uh, certain locations. She gives tips for uh, for you know traveling around some of the uh, the more normal bases that people would travel to in, in Japan and uh, in Germany. Uh, and then uh, I believe Spencer also is uh, going to be posting shortly a space available uh, article on his website as well, which will all be uh, good, good places to go get yourself familiarized with them. Um, and, you know, just, just remember, uh, you know, you get what you pay for out there, but it, there's some real tremendous value that can be pulled, um, uh, from, from traveling with uh, the military aircraft for free. Thanks for all that, Luke. And thanks again, listeners for joining us today. We appreciate your continued support and for all the five-star reviews you're giving us on Spotify and Apple podcast. And thank you for sharing this episode and all of our other episodes with your friends and coworkers who can get a lot of benefit from the topics that we talk about here. Also, for those of you who have purchased my book recently, thank you very much. The book is now on Amazon and hardcover, Kindle and Audible. It's the Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom by Spencer Reese. You can search Military Money Manual on Google or Amazon, or you can go to my website, shop, S-H-O-P dot military money manual dot com. And big thanks to our good friend, Luke, for coming on the podcast and for sharing everything he knows about financial independence and space. A. It's awesome to get another perspective and another military service member who's actively saving investing for FI. We'll see you next week on the Military Money Manual podcast. Hey guys, it's Spencer again. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about my new book. It's called The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom. And it's available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book. This is the book I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In this book, I cover the exact money tactics, investing strategies I use on my path to financial independence before age 40. I break down the math of FI and I explain the exact dollar amounts you need to retire. The book is full of easy to apply financial advice specifically for military service members and their families. I cover tax-free deployments, the thrift savings plan, and many more topics only military personnel can relate to. 
This book was written specifically for you, whether you're active duty, guard, reserve, a military spouse, enlisted, or officer. Both E's and O's will benefit from the lessons in the Military Money Manual. If you're in the Army, Navy, or Air Force ROTC, or if you're a cadet or midshipman at West Point, Naval Academy, and the Air Force Academy, this is the perfect book to start your military career with. Again, the book is available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book, an audiobook, ebook, and my personal favorite, the hardcover book. The hardcover book was printed right here at home in the United States of America, and it will look great on your bookshelf. So check it out. Let me know what you think. And remember, podcast listeners can use promo code podcast to get a special discount. It's called the Military Money Manual, a practical guide to financial freedom. And it's available right now at militarymoneymanual.com slash book. Thanks for listening.